Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. To begin, my name is Nathan, and I am you typical 16-year-old guy. I like the occasional scary movie and getting creeped out with friends, but I have never put much thought into the paranormal or monsters before. Not that I'm a skeptic or anything, I just hadn't really put any thought into it as being real. It all seemed like child's play to me until my week at summer camp last year. It was my third summer to go to this camp and, for security reasons, I don't want to say the name of the camp. My parents had been sending me and two of my friends, John and Seth, to this camp for the past two years and nothing seemed different about this year until our fourth night at camp. At this camp we didn't have tents or cabins. We slept in a type of raised wooden platform with a canvas-like tent over them. I guess they did this because of how rocky and hilly the ground was there. The deck-like platforms were about four feet off the ground, so there was plenty of space under them, and sometimes we boys would hide out under them to jump out and scare each other or play around. Anyway, now that you know what the setup was like, like I said it was our fourth night at camp. Lights out was at ten o'clock and we were all in our cots whispering and joking to one another as the one of the camp instructors worked his way around to all the tent platforms making sure everyone was in their assigned tents and accounted for. It was four boys to a tent so Seth, John and I had been sharing ours with the new friends we had been assigned with at camp. His name was Logan and he was a pretty cool kid. He was a huge Pokemon fan like the three of us so we hit it off great with him. We all fell asleep soon after lights out. At about what I would guess to be one in the morning, I was woke up by a gnawing, crunching sound. The moon was fairly bright that night, but on the inside of the tent platforms it was pitch black, so I couldn't see a thing. It sounded like it was coming from the back corner of the platform, so I immediately assumed it was Seth raiding the cookie stash we had been hiding from the rest of the boys. But before I could chew him out about it, Seth himself said to me in a soft whisper, Nathan, what the hell are you doing? Slightly confused, I whispered right back in the same tone. I was about to ask you the same thing. My eyes has adjusted a little to the darkness, and the moonlight coming in through the small back slit of the canvas tent was helping me to see things better. I could make out the dark shape of Seth sitting up on his bunk, and the my other two friends still fast asleep. As we both sat there listening, I could tell that the sound was actually coming from beneath our platform, where we would hide out and play around. I slipped out of my cot and quietly made my way over to Seth's because his was the closest to the back flap of the tent. By the time I had made it to him, the sounds had stopped. Seth and I both slowly stuck our heads out of the back flap of the tent, and there in the moonlight standing by a tree about thirty feet from the back of our tent stood this wild-looking creature. It was around seven feet tall and was covered in thick matted brown hair from its waist down. Its torso looked like that of a human, except that its arm were much hairier. Its legs resembled a goat's legs, but were still very human-like with hooves instead of feet. The thing's head was the scariest part about it, though. It was a goat's head with long, twisted horns. It was rubbing its horns against the trunk of a tree nearby. Seth whispered in a low strain to me, What in the blue fuck is that thing? I didn't respond. I just kept staring at this thing. I couldn't take my eyes off of it no matter how hideous it was, almost like my eyes were drawn to it. After what seemed like hours, but in reality was only about five minutes according to Seth, this thing stopped rubbing its horns on that tree and simply walked off. Seth and I were terrified. We wanted to go tell our camp director, but his tent was on the opposite row of tents from ours and about five tents down. There was no way in hell we were going out there so that thing could see us if it was still around. We both sat in Seth's bunk, not saying a word till morning. When John and Logan got up, we told them what had happened. At first they didn't believe us and thought we had just teamed up to scare them. But when we told the camp director at breakfast that morning, they knew we were telling the truth. They knew we wouldn't tell them just for laughs or to convince them of the prank. The camp director just brushed us off saying it was probably some of the other boys trying to scare us, or one of the younger directors trying to mess with us. We spent the rest of the week there at camp in utter fear of nightfall. We never heard or saw anything else, though. 
Since the camp directors didn't believe us, we figured our parents wouldn't either, so we decided not to tell them. When summer came around this year, I turned down the offer to go to camp saying I was getting too old for it. It's an awful thing to know something like this and not be able to tell someone. That's why I hope just one person who hears this on here will understand. I know what Seth and I saw that night was not just some of the other boys or directors having some fun. It was real and is still out there, I'm sure. How much farther is it? Neil whined. I had to admit I was getting a bit tired myself. When we first decided to go on a camping trip in the Great Smokies, I wasn't expecting it would be this far. According to the map, we're almost there, Jean said. You mean the map that covers the entire state? Sharon said. Almost there could be a hundred miles. Jean whipped around on her. Do you think I'm that stupid? Of course, it's not a map of the whole state. I picked it up at the ranger station. It only covers the Tennessee section of the Great Smokies. He turned back and began trudging. Well, pardon me, oh great map master, Sharon said under her breath. Jean paused for a moment, then kept going. I knew he had hurt her and wanted to chew her out, but with all that had happened. My thoughts were interrupted by the sounds of struggling behind me. Turning, I found Mike wrestling with his backpack. It had gotten caught in between two small trees and had him stuck fast. Hold on there, bud, I said, trying to get down to him without getting my pack caught. Grabbing trees as I went, I worked my way down and got his pack unstuck. Thanks, man, he said, sweat pouring off him, as if this trip wasn't tough enough. I hear you, I said. You need to take a break for a minute? Yeah, he said, dropping to the ground. I chuckled seeing the smallest of the group panting like a dog in the middle of summer. Hold on here, I'll be right back. I struggled my way back up the hill only to find the rest of the group hadn't stopped when I did. I couldn't even see them. I ran for a little bit on what I thought was the trail, but didn't see any sign. Finally, in frustration, I stopped and let out a yell. Jean, Sharon, Neil, where are you? I heard the words echo back to me, but that was it. There was no answering call, no sound of brush being pushed aside as they came back to me. There was nothing. Even the animals didn't seem to be very talkative. It was quieter than it had been the entire trip. Part of that was surely the lack of Neil whining and Sharon and Jean being at each other's throats. I wish those two would just give up and go get a room. Everybody knew they'd had it for each other bad, but they didn't seem to get it. Or maybe they did, and this is their idea of foreplay. Either way, I was a city boy lost in the middle of the forest. Jean had the map, and I had never been taught anything about direction or survival. I just came on this trip to hang out with my friends. A motel room in Gatlinburg. Five friends catching some shows, shopping in Pigeon Forge. That was what I was here for. It was Gene's brilliant idea to go on this stupid camping trip. Even though he said he got the map at the ranger station, I knew he didn't listen to anything they said about which trail to go on. Gene was always the leader. He would have shooed them off and said he knew exactly where to go, even if he had no idea. Maybe I'm starting to see why Sharon hasn't hooked up with him yet. Maybe she's trying to knock him down a peg or two before he's ready to be civil. It had been five minutes since I had stopped and yelled. Jean, Sharon, Neil. I called again, louder this time. The only thing that got me was a louder echo coming back to me. I looked back at where I'd come from, only I wasn't sure of the exact direction. Jean had led us off the trail a while back, and I wasn't positive where I had left Mike. The dense canopy of trees left a little of the sun peeking through, still high in the sky. At least I'd have daylight for a while. Turning back the way I thought I'd come, I started back toward Mike. At least if we were together, there'd be two of us to find instead of having to search for another. It was a long walk. It seemed like I got to where I was a lot faster than I got back. I suppose trying to catch up with the people who know where they're going will get your feet moving faster. It wasn't long until I realized I'd been walking too far. I had somehow missed where Mike was. Mike, where are you? I called, once again hearing the echo and nothing else. Looking around, I was sure this was where I'd left him. The trees all looked familiar, but then again I didn't know how many millions of trees there were in the Smoky Mountains. There could be hundreds or even thousands of spots that looked exactly like this one. I began to question the wisdom or lack thereof of only one person having a map. A thought struck me. I whipped out my phone and tapped on the Maps app. 
Surely it could at least tell me where I am. Those hopes crashed and burned when I saw the no signal at the top of the screen. Mike, I yelled louder, more to vent my frustration. I collapsed on the ground, feeling more exhausted and hopeless than I had in a long time. And then I heard it. A faint call carried on the wind. It sounded like it was miles away. Mike, I yelled again. I sat and listened, which was easy since the animals weren't making any noise. Again I heard the return call. I hopped up like a dog who'd heard its master's whistle. Taking a general guess at the direction I'd heard it, I began to march determinedly. It wasn't quite a run, but it was no stroll through the park either. The thought of no longer being lost, or at least not being lost alone, drove me forward. After a few minutes I called again, then waited for the answer. It came from the direction I was heading, but somehow seemed quieter like he was moving away from me. I broke into a run. My heavy backpack flopped from side to side, nearly making me stumble. But I didn't care. I was getting closer. I could feel it. I never saw the tree roots sticking up just enough to catch my toe and send me tumbling. I woke to total darkness. Something big and heavy was pressing down on me. I panicked and tried to throw it off, but it had a tight grip on me. Thrashing all around, this thing held me with a death grip. I swung my arms, trying to punch it. My legs flailed to get it off me, but it wasn't happening. It had me and it knew it. The most disconcerting part was how quiet this thing was. It didn't growl or snarl or anything. It just held on to me like its life depended on it. Finally, my energy was spent. It had won. All I could do was lay there and wait for the inevitable. I waited and waited. Nothing happened. Maybe whatever it was, I had fallen asleep. I couldn't imagine all my thrashing around wouldn't have woken it up. I rubbed at my shoulder, which was now sore from the fight with my unknown assailant. As I did, my fingers brushed up against the thing that held me. Out of curiosity, I rubbed it where it held me. I immediately pitched a fit at my stupidity. It was my backpack. My head thumped off the ground in frustration at how stupid I'd been. Slowly, I unsnapped the latch that held the straps together and pulled my arms out. It was a huge weight off my shoulders when the pack rolled onto the ground. I lay there for a moment, having forgotten how dark it was when I was fighting to the death with my backpack. Reaching into my pocket, I pulled out my cell phone and turned on the flashlight. As I was doing it, I saw the no signal was still at the top of the screen. I wondered if there would be any signal until I got out of this godforsaken place. I shone the light around and pieced together how I'd gotten here, lying in a ditch in the dark, in the forest. When I fell, I must have hit my head on the rock I saw in the ditch that had a small patch of dark red on it. I reached up to feel my head and found a tender spot. That'd do it, I said of my unscheduled nap. Checking the rest of me out with the flashlight, I found no other injuries. There remained the original problem of being lost and alone. At least the animals were making noise again. That was somewhat comforting. Having evaluated myself, I shone the light around the area, trying to find out where I was. The answer was simple and frustrating. I was lost in the forest, surrounded by trees. Letting out a sigh, I dug through my backpack and found some granola bars and a couple of bottles of water. Hunger pangs hit me in the gut like a line drive. I ripped open a bar and devoured it. Before I knew it, three of them were gone, followed by a bottle of water chugged like I was in the middle of the desert. As I was enjoying my feast, the animal noises stopped. It made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end to hear such sudden and complete silence. Swallowing my last mouthful of water was so loud it nearly made me jump. As my light drifted aimlessly, suddenly I saw a pair of eyes glowing just inside the tree line. They glowed an eerie shade of yellow. I tried to remember if that meant it was a predator. Unfortunately, something in the back of my mind told me the silence was already telling me it was a predator. Whatever it was strangely seemed to have no fur. Its gray skin made it look like no animal I'd ever seen. If anything, it reminded me of Golem from Lord of the Rings. It was on all fours, but the front legs looked like arms. If I didn't know better, I would have said it was a child lost in the woods. But this was no innocent child. It crept toward me in a way that assured me it was hunting and nothing else. Nothing about the way it moved said, helpless, to me. I unzipped my pack and reached down to the bottom, all the while the predator creeping closer. Come on, I said through gritted teeth, knowing it was down here as I moved things from one side of the pack to the other. It was getting worrisomely close now. 
One good leap and it would be within striking distance. I went for broke and dumped out the contents of the pack, hearing a loud thump hit the ground. I flashed around with my light and found what I'd been looking for. My Glock. I grabbed it and pointed where the Predator had been, fully expecting it to be right in my face. But it was gone. Whipping all around, I searched with the light, gun trained on whatever I saw, hoping to catch a glimpse before it was too late. After a quick scan, I slowly panned around in a circle, searching more diligently for the creature. But there was nothing. Wanting to breathe a sigh of relief, but knowing it could easily be hiding behind any tree, I started picking up my belongings and stuffing them back into the backpack. As I did, the animals began making noise again. It was somewhat comforting to think that thing had left the area, but I didn't trust it. Once my backpack was repacked, I sat down and leaned on it like a pillow, with my back to the edge of the ditch and my phone's flashlight shining toward the trees. My gun sat on my lap ready for some quick action. It wasn't long till my eyes betrayed me, slowly closing, causing me to shake myself awake. Over and over this played out with me struggling harder to stay awake than when I was sitting in church. My phone told me it was after four in the morning. The sun would be coming up in a couple of hours. Then I could continue the search for my friends. My phone also told me it only had 23% battery left. I held a major debate in my head. Keep the light on and lose the ability to use my phone if and when I get a signal. Or turn the light off and save my battery, leaving me at the mercy of that creature. It was an impossible choice until I remembered the animals in the woods were making noises. They were silent when the creature was around. My only question was, do they shut up just for that creature or for all large predators? For the life of me, I couldn't remember. I took one last look around before powering off my phone. Leaning against the pack, my fight to stay alert continued. Each time my eyes snapped open, the sky was a lighter shade of gray. Soon I could see vague outlines of trees looming over me, not frightening or disconcerting at all. At last, I lost the battle and fell into a deep, blissful sleep. I woke to the feeling of sandpaper on my face. Opening my eyes and seeing a deer licking my cheek made me nearly lose my mind. I jumped back, slipping off my pack and falling against the dirt in the ditch. The deer lost its mind as well. It jumped up and galloped away like a herd of hunters were hot on its heels. Once my heart was beating at a regular rate, I looked around at the brightly lit forest. It was late morning and I was still alive. The creature had not come back to kill me in my sleep. I took that as a good sign. Standing and stretching, I tried to figure out how I was getting out of there, let alone how I would find my friends. Shouting was out of the question now. I was sure that creature would see it as a sign of weakness and come running like someone had rung the dinner bell. But how would I find which way I was going before I fell into the ditch? As I stood there and looked back at the trail, I saw the branch sticking up that had caused this whole debacle. I drew an invisible line from where I was standing to the branch. I then followed the line through me and extended it past me towards where I was heading. Looking up to the mountain looming above the trees, I tried to find a landmark to head towards. There was a huge rock that jutted out from the mountain with no trees around it. That was my focal point. I would use that as my compass. Speaking of compasses, I looked to the right and saw the sun rising into the late morning sky. With the sun in the east, I turned back towards my rock and calculated that it was more or less to the north. Having figured out where I was going, I kicked my feet into gear and started getting there. It was a no-brainer that my friends would be worried sick. They were probably already back at the motel making all kinds of calls and organizing a search party. I chuckled at my joke. I knew they were as helpless as I was in the woods. Gene pretended to know what he was doing, but truth be told, he was the worst of the group, mostly because he was too stubborn to listen to anyone else's directions. What if they ran into that creature? The thought froze me in my tracks. That thing looked like it wanted to have me for dinner. Running into the four of them would be like a smorgasbord. I shook the thought away. There was nothing I could do about it anyway, but my cheerful skip in my step at having determined a direction was gone. It was replaced by concern for my friends. As I walked, I thought about Mike, how excited he was to come along and see the Dixie Stampede for the first time, about Sharon and Jean, what a horrible couple they would make and how they fought all the time now when they were just friends. 
Or were they? I'd seen them sneaking little looks at each other when the group was together. Could the whole thing be a ruse? Could they be a couple already and trying to keep it a secret? And then there was Neil. I had no idea why I was friends with Neil. He was one of those people who just started tagging along one day. Before you knew it, they were part of the group. Neil was always competing with Gene to lead the group, but he went about it a different way. He would whine and complain until he got his way. Not all the time, but whenever there was something he left strongly about. Neil didn't want to come on this trip, and honestly, I think we all would have been happier if he hadn't. Being alone with my thoughts had me making good time toward my destination. The forest wasn't as dense here and it was slightly downhill. Good walking conditions. The walk was going so well that I nearly started whistling. I squashed that real quick. I didn't need any additional noise for the creature to track. As it was, I would turn and look over my shoulder from time to time, just to be sure no one or nothing was following. Each time I glanced over my shoulder, the sky behind me seemed to get darker. The sun soon disappeared, and I could no longer deny it. There was a storm coming. I was stuck. There was no shelter except for trees, and rain leaks through them eventually. Even though I knew I would get caught out in the rain regardless, I stepped up my pace. Maybe there was a rock outcropping I could shelter under. As I walked, there was a blinding flash, followed by a deafening boom that knocked me to the ground. At first I thought a bomb had gone off. I looked around and saw a tree burning on the mountain. It looked like some giant had ripped it in half. Staring at this apparition and wondering what the hell was going on, I saw another flash that lit up the clouds. This time the thunder was farther away, but still shook the ground. It was time to find that shelter before Mother Nature chose me as the target for her next lightning bolt. I ran toward the mountain as huge drops of rain pelted my back. It felt like I was getting hit by many water balloons. It didn't take long for the rain to intensify, quickly becoming a deluge. The water came down so hard and fast that the ground didn't have time to soak it up. Since I wasn't on the trail anymore, I stumbled through puddles and many bogs, struggling to stay on my feet as the muddy ground tried to swallow me whole. I held my hand above my eyes, trying to see where I was going, but the rain came down in sheets, reducing visibility to zero. Through it all, I kept trudging as straight as possible, hoping to find shelter. Without warning, I ran into something hard. It looked like I had reached the base of the mountain. I kept one hand on the rock face to guide me while trudging parallel to the mountain. Suddenly, nothing was pressing against my hand. I hadn't realized how much I'd been leaning on the rock until it wasn't there. I fell onto the surprisingly dry ground. Rolling over and looking up, I discovered I was in the mouth of a cave. I sat up and enjoyed watching the rain fall helplessly outside the cave while I was safe inside from the fury of nature. After a short rest, I began to rub my arms to stave off the chill in the air. I took my backpack off and looked through for anything that would be helpful. Fortunately, I'd packed a sweatshirt. I took off my soaked t-shirt and used it for a towel before donning my warm, somewhat dry sweatshirt. While I was looking, I pulled out another granola bar and devoured it, then downed my last bottle of water. Staring at the empty bottle, I held it out to one of the streams of water falling from the sky until it was full. Putting the cap on, I noticed the water wasn't as clear as I would have liked, but I wasn't out of the woods yet, and I might need it somewhere down the road. I sat the pack down, leaning it against the side of the cave entrance, then pulled out my phone and turned on the flashlight. The light penetrated only so far into the darkness. Even the diminished daylight could only illuminate so much. After that, it was like a shadow wall showing only a large black hole. I started into the inky blackness before I remembered and felt for the gun in my back waistband. I pulled it out and checked it, then dried it off and stuck it back in my waistband. I didn't see the need to have both of my hands occupied if I stumbled. I explored the first few feet of the cave, finding nothing spectacular, and was about to come back to my pack and sit out the rainstorm when I smelled something. It was faint at first, drawing me several steps further inside the cave before I could be sure. My mind had to be playing tricks on me because I swore I could smell a barbecue. My curiosity and growling stomach overrode common sense and drove me deeper into the cave. The light of the phone illuminated my steps as I carefully made my way towards the amazing smell of food. It wasn't long until there was a glow in front of me. A fire burned in the distance, just visible 
bathing the cave walls in an orange glow. As the promise of a warm fire tantalized me, drawing me closer, I saw movement out of the corner of my eye that made my spine turn to ice. Coming from the far side of the fire was the creature that had stalked me the night before. At least it looked like the same creature. The eyes shone yellow in the fire's light. It walked on all fours and struck an amazing resemblance to Gollum from Lord of the Rings. I dosed my light and threw myself behind a rock that seemed big enough to conceal me. Straight ahead was the pinprick of light that was the cave mouth and the outside beyond it. Even if I wanted to, the creature would see me and hunt me down if I tried to escape while it was within sight. Daring to sneak a peek, I leaned around the rock to see if it was still there. What I saw horrified me. The creature was tending the fire, seemingly oblivious to my presence. It checked the pieces of meat that lay across hot rocks beside the fire. He took a few off and sat them aside. Then he walked toward the left wall and disappeared. I leaned out a little further to find out what he was up to and wished I wouldn't have. Hanging from a large wooden frame tied in a spread eagle was a human male who had been skinned. The creature came up to him and carved several chunks of muscle with a large, primitive-looking knife. Once satisfied, he brought the pieces of meat back to the fire and laid them on the hot rocks where the cooked pieces of meat had been. He then took the pieces and disappeared into a hole in the wall. I threw myself behind the rock, breathing hard at the sudden realization. Oh my god, that thing killed someone and it's eating him. My stomach lurched at the thought. It took all I had to keep from vomiting on the spot, but I knew how loud I could get when I puked, and I had no desire to let that thing know I was here. I peeked around the corner again and didn't see it. My eyes were drawn to the dead body hanging there. For the first time, I noticed there was another body strung up beside him. It was another naked male, but he hadn't been skinned yet. Two more bodies hung beside that one, one male, one female, both naked. Realization hit me like a sledgehammer as I realized the naked woman was Sharon. Looking again, I saw the men were Neil and Mike. No, 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 I said, abandoning any semblance of subtlety and charging over to see my friends. When I got there and stood face to face with them, hot tears rolled down my cheeks. Their eyes were closed and none of them moved a muscle. I went to them one by one and felt for a pulse, just to be sure. I came to the one who had been skinned first. He had no pulse. My only guess was it was Jean. Next, I moved on to Mike. There was a scar on his neck and gore down the front of him. He also had no pulse. Neil was the same way, scar on his neck and no pulse. As I got to Sharon, I noticed something about her chest. It was moving. She didn't have a scar on her neck. I reached up to take her pulse and her eyes shot open. Instantly, she began to scream. I covered her mouth with my hand, but I knew it was too late. You need to be quiet and pretend you're dead, or I will be, you understand? I said, still holding her mouth. She nodded and I ran around behind them as I heard footsteps approach. I stood behind Jean since he was the biggest of our group and put my hands and feet behind his, posing in the same spread eagle. My only hope was that it didn't notice me. I didn't dare move as I heard footsteps enter the room and come over to where we were. I stood as still as a statue. Only my eyes looked over to where Sharon was hanging. I saw the creature stand and look at her. She had lowered her head again, looking every bit asleep or dead. The creature poked her breast with the knife, drawing a few drops of blood, but she refused to move. And then another creature stepped up to her, and a third. They poked and prodded her to see if she was awake, but she wasn't moving. Panic grew inside me. How many of these things were there? If I knew it was just one, I would have already shot it. But if hundreds waited in the darkness of the cave side rooms, there was no chance. My thoughts were interrupted when I heard sounds coming from them. It was like chittering insects communicating. They spoke back and forth while standing in front of Sharon, who still refused to move. As the argument became heated, I noticed one of the creatures looking in my direction. The longer I watched, the more I realized it wasn't looking in my direction, it was looking at me. It stepped around Sharon to the backside, when its eyes grew wide and it began to screech. The other two looked from it to where it was looking, and eventually found me. Their eyes narrowed as one came around in front of Jean's body, and the other stepped between Neil and Mike. 
The one holding the knife was closest when I gave up on my deception, drew my gun, and shot all three. The sound of the shots in a cave made me instantly deaf. The only thing I could hear was my ears ringing. I grabbed the knife off the ground and cut Sharon down. She collapsed like a bag of rocks. We should go, I said. What? She said. We should... Never mind, I said, picking her up and carrying her over my shoulders like a fireman. I struggled to carry her and hold the gun. She kept slipping off my shoulder, and I would have to grab her to keep her on. The thing was, I was grabbing her naked behind every time. It wasn't like I had a choice or was enjoying it. If I didn't, she would fall off. As I ran, legs already starting to tremble, I felt a rock fly past my cheek. I looked back and there were many more of the creatures running after us. I didn't have time to stop and aim, but I pointed toward the closest one and squeezed off a shot. By some miracle, the creature fell. I didn't know if I'd hit it, or the sound of the gun frightened it, causing it to fall. I had no chance to celebrate as the first rock hit me in the back of the head, nearly causing me to stumble, which would have been fatal. Instead, I pointed and fired another shot, hearing a most satisfying scream. The cave grew brighter as the mouth grew closer. Then suddenly, we were out. It wasn't a cause for celebration, though. I glanced back to see a horde of creatures following us out of the cave as well. So close, and yet so far. My legs weren't going to last much longer carrying her. I needed a break, and I needed it soon. I didn't think they would stop if I turned around and called a timeout. To punctuate that point, another rock hit me, this time on the back. I pointed and fired again in response, disappointed not to hear another scream. Finally, the inevitable moment came. I tripped. Sharon and I went head over heels in a tangled heap. By some miracle, I managed to hold onto my gun. I tried to jump up but ended up falling to the side, still aiming and shooting another creature. They tried to get around us, but I shot two more. Scrambling to my feet, I was able to aim better and shoot another. They still greatly outnumbered us. There were too many of them to count. I aimed at groups, hoping to get more than one kill at a time. They still tried to flank us, and I shot them as they did. But the inevitable moment finally came. My slide locked back. I instantly released it, just in case any of them knew what that meant. I continued to aim at them in a threatening way, and they held their distance not wanting to be the next shot, but they had encircled us and were closing in. I looked at Sharon to say goodbye, but she wasn't looking at me. She had my phone and was doing something with it, hopefully calling for help even though I knew no help would get here in time to save us. Staring into the nightmare faces of these bloodthirsty cannibals, I prayed a prayer of utter desperation. The first one was within reach when suddenly the most piercing sound came from behind me. Looking back, I saw Sharon holding my phone up with one hand and her ear with the other. I held my ears as well. The creatures tried to cover their ears but screamed in agony at the sound. As a group, they ran back to the cave, holding their ears as they went. I couldn't believe it. Turning to Sharon as she shut the alarm off, I smiled. Well, aren't you clever? I said. Not clever enough, she said, looking at her naked body. You think I could borrow your sweatshirt? I chuckled as I took it off and gave it to her. We should find a road and get out of here before they decide to come back, I said. As we walked, she explained what had happened how the creatures had surrounded them, how they thought Mike and I had already been captured. The funny thing was, Jean never gave up hope, she said. He kept telling us to hold on, that you would find us even when... Don't tell me he was still alive when they... She slowly nodded. I can still hear his screams, she said with a haunted look. I don't think I'll ever forget that. I can't imagine. But even after they took his face, he still told us not to give up hope. Amazing. After walking a long time, constantly looking back every few minutes, we came to the greatest sight either of us could imagine. A road. Within an hour, a ranger came by and rescued us. It was the longest hour of our lives, keeping watch for cannibalistic creatures to jump out at the last second and drag us back to the cave. Our friends were never found. The ranger told us we were lucky to make it out alive. Many hikers go missing in the forest and are never seen again. I know Sharon and I never want to see another forest unless we pass by it on the highway. I was at a friend's house for a weekend with a bunch of people, and we all went for a walk. She lives right at the edge of the countryside where there's fields and woods and whatnot. 
So we went down this forest path. Me and this other guy started exploring a bit deeper into the trees and we'd gone quite far down a hill into the thicker trees. But then there was this clearing. There was a big log laying on the ground and resting on it was a skinned deer. No bones or anything, just the skin and its head and antlers. The head was on the log, eyes missing, and the skin was just sort of draped down the front. Beside it was a crucifix made out of planks, not just sticks, and tied up with bale string. Me and this guy freaked out and I called out to our other friends to come see, but he told me not to show them because they'd find it too disturbing. He then shook it off and started climbing back up, but I just stared at it for ages. So long he waited for me and told me to walk away from it. There was also string attached to the crucifix that ran further into the woods, but following it wouldn't be very normal of me, so I just went back. I still can't comprehend what it was. Some kind of pagan ritual? Some kind of prank? Not many people walk this forest path besides locals walking their dogs, and we'd come far off the path too. My friend that lived there said people didn't hunt in these woods, but I didn't want to push it with questions since I'd been told not to tell her. I understand. I wouldn't want to know that there was something like that in the woods behind my house, but I find that the lack of answers has me thinking about it more and more. I think if I wasn't still alive today, I'd believe it was the beginning of a horror movie, where all my friends and I are killed off one by one by a forest witch. It was the perfect setup. Friends hanging out at a country house for a weekend. Two idiots go deep into the woods and find something disturbing. Death ensues. I still feel it was some kind of bad omen, unless I really don't know anything about hunting. And this is regular practice for people who hunt deer in the woods. Can anyone offer me some insight on this? Was this a sick joke? A deeper meaning? Or is this regular hunting setup? What if it's a curse? What if seeing this cursed me and posting this now pressing send will activate the curse? I will see. So this happened about seven years ago. I was around 19, 20, and I was a scout leader. We had a camp in a forest. The nearest city was about 10, 15 minutes drive. Every year in the end July, we would have an international scout camp. Scouts from different European countries would join us. I was in the preparations team and we would go around two, three week in advance to clean and put the tents up. In the preparation team, we had around 20 people, 10, 12 men and the rest women. We were all in our late teens or early twenties. If anyone has been a scout might know that the first thing in a camp is setting up a flag. The flag is important part if this camping game. Other scouts would constantly try to steal the flag. If they managed to steal, then the lost team would have to go home. This never actually happened. No one was ever sent home. It was just a rule to keep other members involved and willing to protect the flag. Therefore, we had to constantly keep an eye or a guard, team member, near the flag. Other games involved attacking other teams and kidnapping members. All fun and games nothing violent or harsh. It was fun and made us be alert 24-7. So here is where my creepy story begins. One night, our preparation team was done with everything. The other two countries from Europe, about 60 people, were set to arrive in the morning. We had nothing to do, so we set up a campfire and started singing and talking. We had our guards people from the team set up in different locations. Two near the flag, two near the entrance, and two in the woods facing the river. So we were tired and decided to go sleep. We would change guards every two hours. Each guard had a whistle. If an animal or a person was to come to the camp, they would blow a certain note of a whistle as to alarm danger. That night I was an hour into sleep when I heard a whistle. We all woke up and ran to the team member who had whistled. She claimed she saw three white figures running fast in the forest near the setup tents. We thought that the morning teams arrived early and sneaked in to steal the flag or kidnap a member. So we all decided to stay awake and go into defense mode. We each stood guard in different locations watching for any signs. After some time, we started hearing whistles from the deeper parts of the forest. We also started hearing radio sounds from different places. We saw some guys in white shirts running around in the forest. Me and two other people decided to check the empty tents to see if there were people hiding in the empty tents, but couldn't find anyone. Then we started walking around and we heard loud laughter from a bush near us. It sounded like a woman laughing. So we started laughing too, as we thought we found the other scout team near the bush. 
Naturally, we walked to the bush without any hesitation. To our horror, there was no one. Then we heard more noises from another bush that was a little bit deeper in the woods. Then we heard a clear conversation between a few people speaking French in an accent. We could hear them clearly, so we checked that again, nothing. Then we saw a guy in white t-shirt running fast again in front of us, but his speed was weird. He was running so fast as if he was sliding. Keep in mind, we were in woods at night with no lights. There's no way someone can run without making a noise, but somehow this guy's was running so quiet. It really seemed like he was just sliding. Again, we still didn't feel threatened. We just had adrenaline rush, but it was more excitement to catch them than anything else. After all, we just wanted the fun to begin. We were excited to see the teams again and have fun. For the next two or so hours, we kept hearing whistles and whispers in French, but we couldn't find a single person. It was so clear there. There were a lot of people hiding around us, but we couldn't catch even one of them. They were fast and so sneaky. This is important to mention that the arriving teams were not from France, so it was weird to hear them speak in French. Anyways, after two hours of running in the forest in the dark, I got tired. I didn't take this too seriously, so myself and a couple of my friends went back into our tent to rest. I laid down, and after ten minutes, saw a car light speeding towards us. This area is not designed for regular cars to arrive. None of us or other teams had cars. A bus from the near city would drop us there and pick us up after the camp was over. We heard a car coming straight towards our tents with high beams on. It was coming so fast that we were frozen expecting it to hit us any moment. It happened so fast that we couldn't even run, then suddenly it just stopped right near our tent. We heard the door open but heard no footsteps. Whoever it was just closed the door and left. We were shaking and at that moment it hit me that it couldn't have been anyone from the other teams. We got out and learned that our other teammates also had seen a jeep speeding towards our tent, but didn't see anyone coming out of the car. After this we just decided to stay awake till morning. Throughout the entire night we kept seeing these white-shirted men sliding around us. We couldn't see any faces, they were fast and weird. We could hear loud laughters and French whispers all around our camp. We could tell there were a lot of strangers near the camp who were either messing around with us or had plans to hurt us. The sun came up and the strange things stopped. We didn't manage to catch anyone or figure out who they were. In the morning the other teams arrived. We had this leaderboard meetings every afternoon where we would discuss daily plans and meals. Also we would share about any planned or failed attacks. All the team leaders said they arrived in the morning so they were not even in the country at night. Up to this day, I have no idea who those people were. I have no idea what they wanted or what their plans were. They never attacked or kidnapped anyone in the team. It was scary when I think of it. What would happen if we didn't have guards that night? What would happen if we were all asleep? At the end of the day, this was a campsite in a wooded area. And woods can be places where cults and crazy people gather. As soon as my master Octavius let me outside, I felt the breeze of the wind touch my whiskers. I cared for him and the rest of his family as if they were my blood mother who I unfortunately never met. Or at least I don't remember her face. She was of no doubt, however, a black cat like me. My masters had cared for me for about eight years, making me a little bit older than your average feline. But when I paid attention to the environment once again, its coolness gave me a warm sensation in my heart for the wilderness was my true love and it was my home, where I could be amongst friends without very much fear. While walking through squirrel territory, I smelled a welcoming scent. A chipmunk was certainly near me, and I was determined to find him, for I don't like my master's food. It tastes like nutrition that was frozen and warmed up again. Not fresh at all, the taste of fresh flesh was much superior. Crouching down on the leaf-filled ground where a lone beetle quickly passed me, I centered my green eyes on my prey. For this would be a hunt to remember, as always. This chipmunk could be my next prey. To be frank, I've lost count of how many of them I have hunted. Immediately following the creature's movement south, I disembarked straight after him, while the winds began racing past my face, faster than a cardinal flying away from the winter. It was a rush few people really felt. The chase after my food continued for quite a long time. Until he went inside a little log, I then felt angry and hit the log countless times with my paw, hoping it would be enough. After about four hits, the creature began to thrash away again. 
He probably was trying to get his breath back, something I don't really do a lot. Like my lioness cousins, I can run for miles and not feel fatigued. When the prey turned to the right to a series of bushes, I knew it was my time to strike and I pounced directly on top of him, reaching his upper body and biting on his neck, cracking it like a nut. The spasms the creature made instilled a slight sadness in me, for I didn't enjoy taking this chipmunk's life, it was just in my nature, a sort of appeasement to my ancestors and a way to get in touch with my wild side. Before eating its organs, I promised him that nothing would go to waste as I sank my fangs into his body. While finishing up, I got to his chest area and smelled a strange scent several meters away from me. It smelled of fear and freshness. I was dumbstruck as the trees around simply became devoid of life while the birds flew away. I could no longer hear all the chirping surrounding me. So, in an act of curiosity, I decided to investigate. As I ran closer to the scent, I saw the source of the stench, and my, was it petrifying. The corpse was drenched in crimson blood, and when I spotted a few areas of cleanliness, the details were obviously pointing to a feline. The white paws with claws still out, a few brown spots on her stomach, and whiskers sticking out her face. I could tell it was female for obvious reasons. She had been murdered recently, not hunted because the cut marks resembled a knife, which measured up from the poor creature's leg to her neck area. A murderer was near, and I was determined to find them. After putting my paw on my fellow cat, I licked her so that she could feel a feline's embrace to the afterlife. I inhaled and picked up the scent which highlighted throughout the forest, which was vast, but luckily a cat's sense of scent was uncanny, only matched by those ferocious dogs. Traversing through the scent patterns led me to an area I was less familiar with. It was a lot louder than the rest of the environment, and it appeared that lights were moving at very high speeds, and the stench that emitted from them made my nostrils flare up. It was natural yet tampered with, just like the food my masters feed me. Whatever it was, it was altered by humans. Upon exiting the vicinity of this strange place, the scent unfortunately disappeared. Luckily, a friend of mine appeared. He was a raccoon I had come to call him, Scavenger, because, well, that's what he was. There wasn't a fly that could escape him, but his appearance this early was surprising. Usually his species doesn't appear until the evening. He turned to me with a piece of something that smelled very, very sweet. His face was as you expect from a raccoon, but he was slightly thinner than your average specimen. Also worth remembering was the chain mark on his leg. I never asked where he got it, and he never told me much, so I tried to keep it to myself. Hey, happy Halloween, he said excitedly with his whiskers moving after finishing his meal. Good afternoon, my friend. I stared at him silently for a while before I enlarged my pupils and greeted him. Thanks for reminding me it's the day of costumes amongst the humans. That's why one of my family members at home was so excited he wouldn't stop talking about it. Well, except for when he coughed. Yeah, well said midnight. He exposed his fangs as he spoke. That means free candy for us. Hope your friend gets better. Likewise, he's a pure soul. Scavenger then toppled the ground and pulled another chocolate wrapped in green plastic. He offered me some too, which I politely declined. I desired to see if he knew more of what happened to my poor brethren. Happened to smell anything strange here recently? Something pungent and sour? Yes, for a while actually it started all the way back in September. He spoke confidently as he was scratching his gray head. What? Since September? I stopped his speech immediately. This can't be possible. How'd you not tell me about this? I knew you'd act like this, but I suppose you're right. There's probably been about six or seven murders now. Poor things, you know. This doesn't make any sense. Why wasn't I able to pick up the scent earlier then? Can you take me to the latest victim? I replied, blinking rapidly. I must apprehend this monster. Sure, but that's it. This kind of stuff creeps me out. Come on. He was eating another piece of chocolate as he turned his head to me. We both walked to where the scent might be, and he left his nest of chocolates behind. The smell was really irritating me. For thirty minutes we traversed the forest and greeted all the somber-looking birds. Our friend the Blue Jay greeted us and told us about the latest murder, how he was startled and came home an hour later due to its occurrence. He also told us to be wary of any humans that might come, because today they would be much more excited and wild. 
We concurred, wished him well, and departed. Scavenger stopped and touched his furry neck, looking at me as he pointed to the way, before he softly spoke. Be careful, Midnight, this is a most gruesome sight. He rapidly ran away back to the safe side. I thanked him and walked into a site surrounded by bushes without leaves and an old worn hammock attached to an old oak tree. Parallel to it was the site Scavenger warned B about. A fellow black cat like me was slaughtered, and his internals were splattered throughout the scene. There was more that I don't wish to tell you. My brother looked youthful as his teeth weren't fully developed. I then bravely came closer to the corpse, licked him on the head, and put my paw on him. Meowing loudly for this ruthless killer was not getting away from me this time, I have picked up his smelly scent, and that's all I need now. I told my brother that I would avenge him and all my other fellow felines. While walking away, I felt sick to my stomach and wanted to remember my human brother, Octavius. How he'd feed me every day and pet me so softly. His heart felt pure like Ben's, and his love for me was unconditional. Upon attempting to contrast them to this murderer, I was unable to do it. How one race could be so vastly different made me realize exactly why we animals fear them so much. This monster just amplifies that behavior. Chasing after the scent for about an hour lead me to another neighborhood completely foreign to me. I could spot trick-or-treaters trying to get candy. After that, I thought about where Octavius was and wished him well. I ran quickly to the back of one of these houses, to the point where I spotted a large wooden fence that was easy to pounce over. Upon landing on the leave-filled ground, the scent smelled stronger than ever. I felt a determination to locate the area and find this monster so he could answer for his crimes until I reached a peculiar-looking shack with a garage smelling of that same sour scent. I knew I discovered my prey, but I honestly felt afraid, for this wasn't going to be an average chipmunk. It was going to a human, and not just any normal one, but a ferocious one with the heart of a demon. I put myself together and quietly headed for the garage. When I looked into the garage, I spotted a large tool shed and an old blue car with rust surrounding it. That was all normal until I saw a bloody chainsaw and knives lined up next to the killer himself. I could only see his back, but that was sufficient to make my tail stand up. His spine was very bony and his complexion was quite pale. The workstation he was working at was the true source of the scent. I saw the corpse of one of my brothers, and I knew if I let my emotions get to me, I'd be torn to shreds. Vigilantly moving alongside the piles of leaves in front of the shack, I heard the killer laugh, and the sound that came from his voice belonged to a man who had smoked far too much. I could also make out his hands, which were covered in blood. I knew it'd be best if I sneaked up on him. So, without much thought or hesitation, I moved up and pounced on him. Unfortunately, he had a sharp ear and turned around, attempting to slice my head off. In his right hand lay a nine-inch knife with blood on it. Ah, hello, kitty kitty, he stated in his clown-like voice. Welcome to my humble abode. Filled with anguish, I spotted his dark apron and an old rigid white t-shirt. His eyes were brown and his hair had a greasy, oily tint to it. His age was probably of a forty-year-old man, but honestly, I didn't care. I just wish he could understand my speech so I could tell him exactly how much I'd come to hate him. For his actions were irredeemable and couldn't be forgotten. Regardless, I just decided to hiss with all my lung power. He laughed hissed back at me, and screeched like a harpy. I didn't expect to have another toy to play with so early on. He laughed, hissed back at me, and screeched like a harpy before he spoke. I told myself not to fear and to be strong, for I knew what my duty was today. I thought about all those poor felines he murdered and dilated my pupils attempting to strike at him. After landing on his face, I scratched his chin and jaw area. I almost got him in the eyes until he threw me off with his filthy hands. I could smell the stench from him, and it wasn't just blood, it was pure evil. Well, got some fight there. The man smiled, exposing his yellow teeth as he spoke. He sounded like a man from those cowboy movies Octavius would watch sometimes. I hissed again at him, until he exclaimed, You want to know why I choose animals instead of people now? because it's easier to cover my tracks when I slay you furballs compared to people. Not to mention I never have to worry about getting sent to prison even if it's illegal. 
Never heard of someone getting the death penalty for murdering animals. Hell, they hurt me in defense more than any human I've hunted in a long while, I swear it. Ain't that something? He laughed like crazy after he spoke. As he told me this, I refused to imagine that he murdered people too. How he would subject them to the same mindless slaughter he did to my brothers and sisters. But I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. This is a lunatic I'm dealing with after all. They do say they start with animals, then go to people, but this time he decided to twist the deal. The maniac took his knife and tried to stab me with it, and I jumped out the way, biting his hand, causing him to scream in agony. I enjoyed that as he suffered like his victims did. I pounced on his chest area and scratched him immensely. He was trying to reach for his chainsaw, but I bit his wrist. At that point, he was just grinning, causing me to get terrified for a bit. While on his body, I kept clawing at him over and over again, mauling his face up as I did so. He was just lying there on that muddy ground. Mercy, mercy, please, you got me. The serial killer begged, cowering in intense fear. In that instant, I was fueled with rage and a sensation of such animosity. I almost wanted to kill him, to end his reign of terror on this earth for eternity. But that's when I remembered my family and friends. How they would feel if they were in this position... How would they react? I couldn't take that chance. I didn't want to become a monster like this man. So I did what I thought was right and simply got off his chest. Walking away, I could still hear his laughs on the floor while he lay bleeding on the ground. When I got back inside the forest, I felt a rejuvenation in the land, that an evil force had been eradicated from this place for good. I could even hear birds wildly chirping despite the evening coming upon us. I marked the territory as my own. I also hoped to myself that the monster would stop slaughtering my fellow felines. I really did. But if he started killing humans again, I prayed that the authorities would stop him for good. For that's not my job, not my destiny. The forests and my family is all I care for. Upon entering the area of lights, I spotted Scavenger again. He came to me and we hugged one another. The forest, it feels better. Is it done? He'll never hurt us again, I promise, I replied while licking myself. Thank you, Midnight, the raccoon said as he put his claws on me. We can all sleep better because of you. Have a good night. Best regards to your family. Thanks you too, my friend. I'd do it again if I had to. We parted ways. I had missed my family a great deal. I had risked my life today, but had survived. But instead of going home immediately, I wanted to check out my territory for a while. It was a new moon after all. I'll be home in a couple hours. That sounds perfect to me. I don't know else how to say this other than I just saw a titanic skeleton in the woods of Lassen National Park. I understand this place is usually reserved for fun, creepy stories, but I have genuinely never been more terrified or confused. What I'm seeing is real, and I can't think of what to do other than beg everyone who sees this to contact me and send help. An hour ago, I was sitting on the front porch of my cabin watching the sunset, and out of nowhere, this enormous rumbling filled the air. The type of rumbling that you can feel the vibration in your bones from. Concerned, my first thought was, maybe there's an earthquake. However, the problem with my earthquake hypothesis was that the ground wasn't shaking. It felt more like a rhythmic vibration, almost as if there were intervals. Clearly, it had to be something else, I thought. Simultaneously, I hear tree branches snapping violently out in the distance behind my cabin, and I can see flocks of birds freaking out, desperately attempting to get away from that area. Not only that, I can see a thin layer of smoke or fog among the carnage. Immediately, my mind jumped to this being an active rock slide, which meant I needed to act fast and prepare myself in case anything was coming toward me. As I scanned the area to see if anything was headed in my direction, my eyes stopped dead back around to where I had seen the first signs of trouble. For a solid minute, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I suppose that doesn't really do it justice. It was more like my brain completely denied the reality of what I was literally staring at. A hellish adaptation of a human skeleton towered over the trees. Note that I only say skeleton because while it was close to the proper shape of one, it was entirely covered by a black film. I would tell you that the film was the thing's skin, but it ungulated and popped in weird spots like an unfathomably extensive collection of maggots, 
all moving in spastic and discontinuous patterns. Pieces of the black mass seemed to fall off as it moved through the trees and scrapped violently against branches. Its arms hung low to its sides, and massive three-fingered hands that fell below its kneecaps made no attempt to move the obstacles in front of it. Its long neck was the most inhumane part of its anatomy. If it was a regular-sized model, I'd assume someone had borrowed it from a horse or similarly shaped animal. Despite the goofy-looking nature of its neck, I could quickly tell its purpose was to allow the thing a much better range of movement to aid in its search for whatever it was looking for. This was made all the easier by the fact that it emitted two bright beams of light from its eyes that illuminated the woods below it. Silly as it sounds, it was like the thing had built-in searchlights that it used to scan every tiny being under its unrelenting gaze. By some miracle, the skeleton was a good enough distance away from me that it either hadn't noticed my presence or didn't care enough to inspect me. That being said, I was still effectively pinned down. Suppose I wanted to get in my car and drive off. In that case, that'd require me going into the cabin, finding my keys, starting my car, turning on my headlights, and manually opening a decently sized steel gate just down the road. There were enough steps in my head that I could very well alert it to my position. In an emergency, maybe I could plow through the gate. Still, considering the potential damage to my car, it may not have been usable to outrun the giant to the highway. Secondly, if I'm being honest, seeing that monster made me too frightened to move any part of my body anyway. Some of you may call me a coward, and that's fair. But when that early hominid part of your brain that saved our ancestors from cave lions and birds big enough to snatch children away tells you to stay put, you fucking stay put. Unfortunately, in staying put, I damn near almost lost my hearing when the skeleton opened its mouth and emitted what sounded like a profoundly distorted mule deer call. It searched around a small area for about ten minutes, calling out at different frequencies. All this before I shit you not, I sneezed. It stopped in the middle of its call, waited a couple seconds, and briefly switched to what sounded like a child on a loud intercom and said, Hello? I felt my heart drop as the twisted puzzle pieces came together. Before I knew it, my hands were glued to my nose and mouth, fearing that the slightest breath would send it over to me in a frenzy. It took a single step in my direction and flashed those demonic eyes over my property. Luckily, the cabin blocked me from that wretched light, but I had clearly piqued its interest, and it was easily tall enough that it would be able to see me on the other side if it got close enough. It took another cautious step towards me, and at a lower frequency, repeated its inhuman question. Hello? Fighting every urge to run into the woods and hide under a rock, I summoned the mental energy to prepare for what was coming next. Cursing myself in my mind, I slowly and quietly turned towards the door to begin a race for my life. But just as I had done so, I heard a groan in the distance. To my surprise, it sounded like that of an actual mule deer. The skeleton must have picked up on the noise at the same time. Its long neck immediately snapped in the direction of the sound. Its wretched searchlight eyes began flashing rapidly and, in the sloppy manner of a starving animal, it began to tear through the trees toward the noise, as if the prey it was silently stalking just moments ago never even existed. I took the opportunity to bolt back inside my cabin, grab my keys and hide under my bed with my phone, a rifle, and a pillow, to stifle even my most shallow breaths. It's been about an hour since it left, and I haven't heard anything from outside, but I'm too afraid to go out and check. I'm leaving as soon as the sun rises, but for now, I feel as trapped as I did when I was in the open. I made a quick call to 911 to try and explain to them what happened and request that they send as many units as possible out to me immediately. But as expected, they essentially thought I was on drugs and suggested that whatever I saw couldn't hurt me and just sleep it off. Texts to my friends aren't going through because of the shitty service. Trying not to break down from the frustration, I began typing this. At this point, all I can think to do is write up this story detailing my experience and post it online in hopes that my internet miraculously works and that one of you can contact someone who believes me and send help. Or, in case it kills me, keep a final testament to my last few hours on Earth. The least I can do is let the people that care about me know that I didn't go crazy out here or get eaten by a bear. If anyone has any idea what I'm dealing with, please give me the information I'm missing. 
I'm unsure if there are similar stories around Lassen or if this is a first, but I need to know what's out there if I'm going to survive the night. Here's hoping. Once again, this isn't a joke for your entertainment. I'm not trying to scare anyone or be at the center of some urban legend. I'm just a really scared guy who's desperate for someone to believe him. And I'm begging everyone that reads this, please help me. A friend and I decided to take our first backpacking trip together. It was late June along the PCT in the North Cascades. The trail still had snow once you hiked above a couple thousand feet. After three days of novice snow navigation, we thought we could drive farther south to White Pass and ditch the snow. It hailed and poured half the drive down, so it was a lucky decision and great timing. We parked the car and chatted with a random hiker that Kiot asking about our car and our gear. We wanted to know everything about us, and he accidentally overheard me saying he was crazy. He glared at us as we drove away, when we finally started up trail after he left. The weather had lightened up, but it was already around 4 or 5 p.m. The trail was covered in horse manure, until about 1.5 HRS into hiking when we started getting to large patches of snow. We started post-holing, our feet dropping 6-10 inches deep into snow depending on the step. We finally reached where the horse tracks and footprints stopped. Buff had to keep going to find camp. The sun started to set. We began bickering about whether we turn back or keep moving forward. There was no good place to sleep in either direction. We push forward and are met with a small clearing where we could set our tents up in the snow. As we finally settle down and get the tents set up, we notice bear tracks through the snow. We start looking at the trees and notice bark is torn off everywhere and they're covered in claw marks. We found bear droppings and different size tracks near our tents. We freak out realizing we need to hang our food really good and have little time. There is no time to move camping spots. Panicking, we get our food hung, but his has too much weight and the branch keeps bending. The trees are mostly bare and have few sturdy branches. We try until there is almost no time left. In the near dark, he begins throwing large branches around next to a tree to try and cover his food something we both knew a bear could get to easily. We hustled to our individual tents and tried texting our coordinates to family, but had no luck. Neither of us had service. We held our knives closely that night. At about 3 a.m. I hear a loud scream in my friend's tent rolling around. In an utter panic, I open my tent flap, shine my headlamp, and there was no bear. His tent fell down in the snow. We laughed harder than ever and slept great the rest of the night. When I was 18, I dated a boy who was the eldest of eight kids, just as I was. We desperately wanted to go camping and thought our parents would let us go if we took all the younger siblings as chaperones. I think a couple of kids wisely stayed home, but we ended up as a party of 14, in two station wagons, heading up to Sequoia National Park in California. We had gotten a late start, so we arrived at our reserved campsite pretty late that night. We had been warned about bears. So we're surprised when we found that the previous campers had thoughtfully left the campfire ring full of reeking open tuna cans. I'm sure they just meant to be generous, but it certainly left us in a difficult position. With a herd of kids ranging from age 6 to 16, and the night cold setting in, we lit a fire to burn out the cans and quickly made sandwiches for dinner. It was just too late and too cold to do anything else. After hustling 14 people into one big tent, one small tent, and a couple of brothers in my family's new station wagon, we were finally all bedded down in our sleeping bags. It was dark, very dark and quiet. I heard the sound of something bang into one of the trash dumpsters about 40 feet from out campsite. I knew it was a bear. Just then a small voice piped up. I can't find my peanut butter sandwich. I bolted up and whisper shrieked, when did you last see it? When I was getting into my sleeping bag, came the reply. So now, with a fading flashlight, amidst a sea of sleeping bags, I frantically searched for the damn sandwich. I couldn't find it, but I noticed something new. I could now smell the bear. It was in our campsite. There didn't seem to be anything I could do. I could smell and hear the bear wandering around, so we would have to stay in the tent. I found myself regretting burning the tuna cans in the fire ring. Perhaps they would have drawn the bear away. I spent most of that night imagining a bear entering our tent and eating our legs. And I was supposed to be the responsible big sister. What would mom say? It was only when I heard the honk of the horn from our station wagon 
hours and hours and hours later, that I heard the bear dash off and was finally able to sleep. When I awoke in the morning and walked outside, my two brothers were standing by our station wagon now covered with a number of scratches in the paint. While sleeping in there, they had left the sunroof open. Since our food was stored there to avoid attracting bears to our site, the bear had naturally climbed on the car and attempted to pry the sunroof off. It was then that my brother awoke and honked the horn, driving the bear away. After an incredibly eventful week, we finally returned home, and I had to show my mother her scratched car. Even though we'd only had it for about six months, she was amazingly understanding. She could see that this trip had been no picnic. We even had one car run out of gas right as it was driving through the tree that the road passes through. No problem, we had enough kids to push it to the side of the road. Then I settled them into an assembly line to make emergency sandwiches. We might have to stay here for a while, you know. Anyway, my mother took me to lunch at the Beverly Hills Hotel within days of returning. She felt that I deserved some luxury after what I'd been through.